All right. So hello and welcome to episode four. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from across the country co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We're going to begin with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. So Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Penacook and the Patuxet people and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoka, and Nipmunk nations. We honor all indigenous people who are here now, have been here for time immemorial, and will be here in the future. We acknowledge indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempted erasure of indigenous peoples. We commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities, and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. So join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through December for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at peabody.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. And if you are enjoying our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And today we are excited to welcome Dr. Paulette Steves. Dr. Steves is Cree Matisse and was born in Whitehorse Yukon Territories and grew up in La uh, La Lewitt, uh, British Columbia, Canada. She is an associate professor in sci uh, sociology, anthropology at Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and a Canadian Canada research chair in healing and reconciliation. She holds an adjunct faculty position at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick, and her research focuses on the Pleistocene history of the Western Hemisphere reclaiming and rewriting indigenous histories and healing and reconciliation. Her first book, The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Americas um, from the University of Nebraska Press was published July 1st, 2020. And you can actually buy it on Amazon. Um, and I highly recommend it. So during um, and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll give then our speaker time to answer as many as they can with the understanding that we might not get to all the questions. So welcome Dr. Steves and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, just uh, give me a minute here to share my screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There we go. Oh, something. Do you see the whole screen? Nope. We just see the part of it and then the slides on the side. Oops. Um, so remember, if you do the slideshow. Yeah, I did that. Oh. So. Uh, Sorry, everyone. We had technical yeah. difficulties earlier, too. Yeah. Let I love updates. Stop share. Stop share. Usually this goes very smoothly, but hang on, give me a second. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so, um, okay, play from start. How's that? Do you see just the slide now? Um, no, you haven't shared screen yet. Oh, goodness me. Let me go back. Share screen again. There, did that work this time? Hang well, on hold on, give it a moment. Uh, Go from play from start. 
Yeah, I've already done that. What are uh, you seeing? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We're just seeing the we're seeing the main screen, but we're also seeing all the slides on the side. Well, I think I'm just going to have to leave That's it there. Right. If you can see the main screen good because on mine I see just the slide. So my book is called The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. And um, I'd like to remind people that there are many worldviews in this one place earth, but an informed intellectual realizes their own ignorance of the worlds they know of, but know nothing of. So to understand, you know, archeology span and history, we, we have to understand other people's worlds. So I like to just kind of offer three learning objectives. One, uh, people really need to understand the colonization of knowledge production and how it shapes your worldviews of others. Um, we need to apply critical thought to inform our worldview of others and understanding how history is actually written and taught and how that impacts indigenous people. So I'm, a, I'm indigenous, I'm Cree Métis and I do all of my research is framed in indigenous method and theory and research is ceremony. So Tansi, hello in Cree. My name is Paulette Steves. I am an indigenous Cree Métis archeologist. My research is focused on Pleistocene archeological sites in the Western hemisphere of the Americas and reclaiming indigenous histories. The um, existence of hundreds of ancestral sites dating into the Pleistocene creates a dialogue from which indigenous people can challenge erasures of histories. It foregrounds their indigenous identities and their links to the land and it empowers them in seeking justice. Um, I don't, are you trying to advance slides? Cause we're still on the first no. slide. No, no, I'm not yet. Okay, okay, everyone then. And some people I think are having some audio problems. Um, is anyone else having audio? Okay, I think we're good then. Sorry, Paulette. So my research is framed um, in, in indigenous method and theory and is based on respect, relationality and reciprocity. It is a praxis that weaves through institutional and public spaces to create social change. In sharing details of who I am, I claim my ancestry, acknowledge my ancestors, and declare my position as a researcher and author. I intentionally locate myself as an indigenous person first and a researcher second. This presents the ways of being, knowing, and doing that my research is based in. In indigenous research, respect, reciprocity, and relationality are central to all that we do. Thus, I present this introduction as a respectful way of creating a relationship with listeners before I share my story. This is a picture where I, of where I grew up in Lillooet, BC. It was here I met with a Salish elder, Leonard Sampson, in 1988 to receive his guidance and counseling during a difficult time in my life. He told me that the elders had watched me grow up and they had talked about my place in the world and they felt I had an important job to do that would be very difficult. And that what I was going through at the time was training to learn how to deal with difficult situations because what I would do in the future would be even harder than what I was experiencing at the time. He told me that what I would do would be important work for Indian people, not just our communities, but all Indian people. At the time, I was a newly divorced single mother of three young children. I had a grade eight education, 26 cents and a truck. I had no idea what it was I would do. I had no plans to attend college or earn a PhD. However, I began my undergraduate degree in 1995 at the age of 40 and began my graduate studies in 2008. I earned my PhD in 2015. It took me 26 years to realize what Leonard Sampson had alluded to back in 1988. I just had to reclaim thousands of years of history for indigenous people and be a part of rewriting history. That is what I was given to do. The very difficult part was not the research. The very difficult part was being an indigenous person in a Western colonial academy. So many indigenous scholars share their research as stories because stories reflect on where people are in their lives and where they come from. In an indigenous story, methodology, 
does the work of decolonization. Aman Sayam and Eric Riskies argue that stories are decolonization theory in its most natural form. They are resurgent moments which reclaim epistemic ground that was erased by colonization. In processes of resistance, resurgence, and reclamation, stories lay the foundational framework for indigenous sovereignty and the reclamation of material ground. Stories go in circle, they don't go in straight lines. So it helps if you listen in circles because there are stories inside and in between stories and finding your way through them is as easy and as hard as finding your way home. Part of finding is getting lost. It's when you are lost that you open up and listen. So American archeologists have created many stories regarding the indigenous past of the Western hemisphere, the Americas. They claim that the so-called Clovis people were the first people to enter the Western hemisphere and that they walked across the Bering landmass around 11 to 12,000 years ago. American archeologists often discuss the first people of the Western hemisphere as Asians from Asia. I like to remind archeologists that Asia never existed or Asians as a distinct cultural group 12,000 years ago. Modern cultural identities are much more recent phenomena. And that is a terminology that is used to erase indigenous identities. Despite Western claims of unbiased science with results of archeological sites supported by solid evidence, there were many Western archeological stories that travel around in unending circles of confusion and disagreement and are lacking in data and evidence. Like the story of the Clovis people, the only place the Clovis people ever existed was in the wildest imagination of the archeological mind. The first people and their descendants are indigenous to the continents of the Western Hemisphere and have been so for thousands of years. The Western Hemisphere is where their cultural identities and lifeways were born. This is where they are from. All indigenous people have their own histories and stories to tell. Their stories are literal and metaphorical and meant to be woven through minds, hearts, and spirits across time as listeners grow into understanding of all of our relations and their place among them. To summarize my research, I sought to gain an understanding of the evidence for and environmental possibilities of pre 12,000 year old Pleistocene sites in the Western Hemisphere and thus human migrations to the Western Hemisphere. What I have found through my research is that there are hundreds of pre Clovis or pre 11,000 or 12,000 year old archeological sites in both North and South America and evidence of mammalian migrations between the Western and Eastern hemispheres across millions of years. There are many forms of supporting evidence in every area of research. When seeking to answer questions, it's important to consider all forms of evidence and to weave a story based on a holistic view and practice. This is the Northern Hemisphere of, uh, this is North America 21,000 years ago. And as you can see, it's covered in ice. And it's interesting, and people, most people don't know this, but in Cree, there's a word for when the ice went home. I don't think your slides are advancing because we don't see the ice covered. You don't see a map of North America? Well, it's, it's still on the first slide. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> let me- let well, Technically, me, yes. Let me uh, stop sharing and reshare and just do it the old fashioned way. Hang on. Escape. Give me a second. Yeah, you should have seen quite a few uh, slides by now. Do you see a different slide yes. now? Yes, now it's covered by ice. Okay, okay. So my apologies, you could have hollered at me earlier. We're, we're down already now on slide 10. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave it here if you can see that. So, yep. so this is North America um, 21,000 years ago. 
And as you can see, it's covered in ice. In the Cree language, there is a word that translate to when the ice went home. And that tells us that people were down here below the ice and they were here when it receded. So we, we know they were here before glaciation. So when I talk about many forms of evidence, um, when you're doing, if you're doing good research, you need to look at all forms of evidence, include, including the indigenous people's language and stories. So as you can see, it's covered in ice. There would, this would not have been a viable route for humans or mammals or route for migrations during that time because there was no food, right? And so even if you get up to 11,000 years, it's still going to take 1,000 years for anything to start regenerating. So here is um, North America 2 million years ago. So what you see 2 million years ago, it was actually a subtropical forest. There was a land connection it becomes a very uh, viable route for, for mammals and for humans. If you look at um, areas of Northern Asia, we know there are sites there dating up to 2.4 million years. And there's a site up here in Northern Asia that dates to 2.1 million years. So by this time, uh, early humans had migrated out of Africa acclimatized to different environments, learned the environments, and they were up here in Northern Asia. So why would they stop, right? It doesn't make any sense. Um, we're supposed to believe that for over 2 million years, people were in Northern Asia. So they were just over here and they never came over here. That's an anomaly. That doesn't work. So. We, what we need to do is look at the evidence for those paleo environments in mammalian migrations. So one of the reasons uh, that people haven't been doing that is because this area of archaeology in the Americas has been called an area of academic suicide. And archaeologists that did publish on these early sites in, in the Western Hemisphere faced a lot of criticism, very violent criticism. So it's really stopped people from even seeking to discuss older sites or look at older sites. So what are the, some of the mammals that we know? So if we look at mammalian migrations, that gives us really good timelines, interglacial timelines, for when there was a land area and mammals went back and forth between the Eastern and the Western hemisphere. So this is the dawn horse. The dawn horse arose in the Americas. And paleontologists have discussed many species that arose in the Western Hemisphere and migrated to the Eastern Hemisphere and vice versa. So mammals migrated across the land bridge from the late Pliocene, at least 5.3 million years ago, to the late Pleistocene, 2.5 to 10 million years before present. There were some odd-toed ungulate species that represent just a few of the mammals that arose and evolved in the Western Hemisphere. So if you look at this picture, what at all here looks North American? Okay, so these are Canadian geese, but this is Ellesmere Island and these are camelids. So camelids have been dated on Ellesmere Island at three, over three million years ago. So we know that camelids arose in the Americas, which means they had to walk, because they can't fly like birds, they had to walk to the Eastern Hemisphere. Another mammal that arose that went around the world, it rose in North America, was the saber-toothed cat. So this, according to Wallace et al. 2013, this very late hemophilian record is the oldest for the tribe, thereby supporting a North American origin at least 5 million years ago. So the mammals give us one form of evidence that show the connections and the migration possibilities between the Eastern and the Western hemispheres. So if you're an archeologist, you recognize that this is a nice picture of a stratigraphy and a Clovis point. So what do we need to say that a site is a legitimate site? We need undeniable artifacts, unmistakably made by humans, um, a well-recorded and indisputable context within the stratigraphy and a valued and reliable control over chronology, which meant an undisturbed stratigraphy and good dates on materials, preferably by at least three different labs. So what are some of those sites? So in the top picture here, we see the top per site. This site has dated to over 50,000 years at its lowest levels. A graduate student did his dissertation on wear use on those tools and he 
argued that they were definitely human. Um, both uh, Dr. Goodyear and the McAvoys who worked on Topper site here and the Cactus Hill site here have discussed the critiques and, and what they had to push back against. And, and Goodyear said he felt odd putting a career of 30 years on the table, but there was no turning back. He wanted to tell the truth about his site and the dates. At Cactus Hill, the McAvoy said they invested more time and money defending their dates and conducting new tests than they had ever imagined. And although they think the antiquity of the site has been established, the effort has been so stressful that if they had to do it all again, they might not dig so, so deep. And that's what has happened to a lot of archeologists in North and South America. They don't wanna face the stress. They don't wanna face their critique. So they stay silent on old, older sites. So if we look at, this is just a sample, a map I made a sample of some of the sites in North and South America. So the little green dots are sites that are over 12,000 years and the yellow dots are sites that are over 18,000 years. So this isn't all the sites, it's just a sample, but you can see um, that people covered the Americas in every quadrant. And these are only the few sites we know of, right? So we know at 12,000 years, people already covered all of North and South America. So they had to be here a long time before that to have reached all these areas. The yellow dots, we know here in um, central Mexico, there are four sites that date at least over 200,000 years. In Southern California, there's a number of sites. And so what you see is you kind of see a regional area of very early sites here on the west coast of North America. So when we find an archeological site that dates earlier than Clovis, we want to understand that site. We look at the tools, we look at the, the data and the evidence, but we look for other sites that have been reported around there that maybe have the same tools, the same dates. And so if you look around the, this site here, number one, Co Coates Hind sites in Tennessee, you see that this isn't all of them. This is just some that I mapped. There's a number of sites around it that have the same kind of technology and the same dates. So we know we have a regional area within that time frame. Uh, this is a picture of me at the Lucina site, and I, the museum was out there, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, taking official pictures. And I didn't realize to the end of the day I had my T-shirt on inside out all day. But um, here I am. This is a uh, this is the site. There was. Uh, Excavations held here over 11 years. There were a number of field school. A lot of people worked here, Steve Hole and Robin Bonickson and a number of others uh, did a lot of really good work on this site. They got federal funding to build this beautiful berm because when they started working, the, the reservoir was up against the site. Of course, as soon as they built the berm, the water receded. So in this picture on the, on the right, I'm standing over here on the end at this, this area is unexcavated and mammoth bone, chipped mammoth bone keeps eroding out. So every summer they go out and collect it and document uh, where, what part of the site it came from. These are a few specimens from the site. So this site had um, spirally fractured mammoth bone. So it's been argued the only way that these huge mammoth bones can be broken is by bashing them with a huge rock. So they contain very valuable nutrients. They contain marrow and they made wonderful stone tools. So we know that people in a lot of areas of the world used boulders, small boulders, held boulders to bash open large bones to get um, materials for tools and to get at the marrow. This is a Lucina site here, number one in southwestern Nebraska. It's along the Medicine Creek Reservoir. And as you can see, here we also have a regional area. We have a number of other sites around the Lucina site with the same kind of spiral fracturing technology, some of them had stone tools, and dates that range from 14,000 to 22,000 years. So once again, we can say, well, here is a regional area. This is um, an area they now call uh, where the Soretti Mastodon came from. This is in Southern California. They were building a little connector between Highway 15 and Highway 5 on the coast, and they hit over 114 archaeology sites. One of those sites had a mastodon tusk that was completely 
straight up and down in the ground and the bones in that area were set out in a neat fashion. There were two femur heads together. There were some ribs together. It wasn't as if the animal died and he was just scattered there. It looked like humans had rearranged the bone. So here's one of those bones from the site. You can see here, there's a really nice circular, half circular mark on this mammoth bone. And it's argued that that's where a human took one of these boulders that were found with these remains. And that is an impact point. So this, this site and this collection sat well curated in the Museum of, I think it's called the Museum of Man in San Diego for, for a long time, because the author of the article on the Ceretti site, Dr. Holan and his peers, the people that worked on this, wanted to wait until technology of dating got to a place where they felt it was safe, it could not be argued against. So this was published in 2017, and the dates from this site are over 130,000 years. And of course, as soon as they published that, it was in Nature, they were immediately violently attacked and critiqued for publishing on that site. Here's a, a drawing of how the mammoth tusk was found. It was pretty much straight up and down the ground. So the mammoth couldn't have died unless he did a headstand and fell off his tusks, right? Um, a human had to do that. So there's a lot of really good, strong evidence from this site. If we look at the regional area, we can see number one, this is Lacina site. Uh, number two is an area in the desert just east of there where a carved mammoth bone was found. Number three is the Calico site, which Lewis Leakey argued was 200,000 years old. And Ruth Grun defended his work on that site. Because um, he, of course, as soon as he did that, he was called a crazy old man. This is China Lake and Basalt Ridge, which also have claims of much older sites. And just south of here are those four sites around the reservoir in Mexico. And some of them have dated to 200,000 years. So once again, we see solid evidence of a regional area of older habitation. So um, to complete my uh, research, I traveled a road through my own connections to the land and the impacts of cleaved and disrupted connections to place and past. I came to understand that political and social disparities, including high rates of suicide among indigenous populations are intimately tied to historical, anthropological and archeological knowledge production of dehumanization and erasure. So when I started looking, um, looking at this research, I, I didn't know how many uh, older sites there were. And I asked Steve Holland, and he gave me a name of 10 sites. He said, don't tell anybody what you're researching. They're just going to think you're crazy. But if it's your PhD dissertation, you pretty much have to discuss it, right? So, so I began looking and after two weeks of looking and I kept every time I read a paper I'd find out about two or more three sites or another book and then I found um, Dixon's book Boats, Bones and Bison that listed over 40 sites and I got real excited in two weeks I had over 500 sites. I now know of over 4,000 sites that predate Clovis. So um, this course is on the histories of indigenous people of the Western hemisphere historically framed in Eurocentric archeology span are more a product of powerful ideologies based in a colonial past than they are of the known archeological record. The historically embedded boundary of recent post late, glac late glacial maximum timeframes for first migrations to the Western hemisphere is not simply based on the archeological record, but it is a political construct maintaining colonial and power and control over indigenous heritage, material remains and history. So you need to remember that capitalism is deeply tied to artifacts, right? Many people have built their academic career on indigenous people's artifacts. All of those artifacts pretty much have been removed from their indigenous homes and their indigenous stories and their meaning to indigenous uh, people. 
Vine Deloria Jr. argued that unless and until Indians are in some way connected with world history as early peoples, we will never be accorded full humanity. He made a very important uh, point with that. And I concur with Vine Deloria Jr. that Indians will never be accorded full humanity until they are related to world history on an ancient time frame. But beyond that, it's not just relating indigenous people, it's using indigenous knowledge from their languages, their stories, their rock art. There are oral traditions that we can link to archeology span sites that date pre 10,000 years ago, like the Kissimmee site, or not the, sorry, the Kissimmee site. There's the Palm de Terre River site where um, the Osage people had an oral tradition of a battle between great beasts, which were mastodons and mammoths. And they, every year they went and they had a ceremony to thank the beast because after their battle, it was then safe for the people to once again hunt in that area. And we can directly link those stories to an archeological site that was found there that contained many stone tools and bones of uh, mammoths and mastodons. So um, this is my new uh, recent, recently released book, The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. It's available pretty much on every bookstore online. So I guess now we have some time for questions. Yeah, so if anyone has uh, questions, you can put it either in the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, we did have one question earlier from uh, Bruce about how to find it on Amazon. So um, people should be able to see, I put the link uh, to her book um, for Amazon on that. And don't forget to do Amazon Smile and pick the MAS as your uh, donation site. Um, so yeah, so while we wait for, uh, oh, um, for Mary Ellen and Michael who have raised their hands, if you guys can just put it into the Q&A, your question, um, I will read those. Same uh, with you, Carol. Okay, so we have one question. So, um, so Ryan says, I love that you quote Scotty McNeish in your book several times. Maybe you could talk about your research visit to the Peabody and Scotty's work. Yeah, Scotty's work was pivotal to um, understanding that there was an early history beyond 12,000 years in the America. And I just, you know, from reading his work, I just get the impression that he didn't give a damn who critiqued him or what they said. Uh, because the evidence he found was amazing. And I've heard people critique his evidence. Oh my God, look at his maps. They are so incredibly detailed. His maps of, of a site floor have every little flake and, and piece of rock or tool that was there. So I think, you know, Scotty did really, really good thorough research and he did a number of sites. And I just think he was an awesome, awesome person. Yeah. Um, we have another question from uh, Elizabeth Perry. She says, hi, Paulette, any info on Bob Ballard's efforts to find human DNA in underwater caves on the West Coast? No, I haven't seen anything on that yet. There are a number of articles out there on some of the caves around, I think it's Coxet Land, and um, that they're working on that is great. But we, you know, we have to remember that when it comes to DNA, that uh, archaeologists or you know geneticists have less than than five percent of the modern indigenous peoples' DNA, and less than one tenth of one percent of ancient DNA. And you can't make any um, sort of overarching claims on such a small set of data. Okay, uh, we got another question in from um, Brother N. Uh, he said, I heard you on WBAI a while back. And what are your thoughts on Graham Hancock's America Before? I don't think I've read that. My oh. apologies. <laughs> hey, you know, it's all good. Um, we have a question from Vic. Can you share any sites along the Northeast that might fall within this research? Yeah, there. I have a number of sites. So I have a website out there called TIP, the Indigenous Paleolithic Database of the Americas, where my research is, and I have databases on there. So we know the site on the um, off the East Coast, on the continental shelf, where they pull up a mastodon skull and and a laurel leaf point. 
So we know those points are points that look exactly like them are found in an area of France that what we know as France today and date to over 22,000 years. And we know that, that that skull dated to over 22,000 years. So the, the continental shelf was dry land until recent times. So that's an entire cultural area. So I've done a lot of research for the tribes in the Northeast on that area. So that, you know, people going out there and wanting to build the big wind towers have to be very careful because I've argued that the whole area is a cultural site. So you always need to have archeologists on board monitoring when you do work. But there are a number of sites also along the coast there that date to older than 20,000 years. I think I found 150. Oh, uh, wow. They would all be in uh, 100, 150 that date to over 10,000, I think. Okay. Sort of a uh, follow up to this. Um, wants to know, are you familiar, and I'm gonna mess up this name, the work of Bruce Remsch from Hatwick College and the there's a site northeast of Binghamton. I don't know. Oh, I don't know Bruce Remsch. I do know Binghamton. Okay. So that's uh, something I should uh, actually do some research on. Okay. Um, Laura Lee would like to know is, um, you sort of have alluded to this, but why is there why is there just so much resistance to acknowledging that indigenous people have been here for you know maybe at least a hundred thousand years or you know longer and just wondering if it's politically motivated you know sort of land claims things like that that's what it's Laura absolutely was. political so you, you got to go back to the history of archaeology and I cover the history of archaeology in my book and <clears throat> realize that. Um, Herlishka claimed we'd only been here three 3,000 years, you know, based on a tiny, minute amount of evidence from Alaska. You know, mm -hmm. the Indians have only been here 3,000 years. He argued with Jesse Figgins, who found the site in Clovis, New Mexico, that showed we'd been here minimally 10,000 years. Herlishka went to his grave denying that we'd been here. So it was set in archaeology. Archaeology is a child of colonization, controlled by... Um, colonizers who had a vested interest in supporting the nation state in erasing our history. So when you show that people have been in an area longer, you legitimize their claims to the land and their ownership of the land, the artifacts, the stories, right? You, you rehumanize them. So in the 1920s, you know, late 1920s, Figgins finally argued for enough years and got enough evidence to show that People had been here minimally 10,000 years. The dates have been stuck at 11,200 years, you know, or Clovis time frame since. If you look at the rest of the world, human history, human evolution, what we know about people and sites has vastly changed over the last 30 years because we've got such wonderful advanced technologies now. And people in the rest of the world aren't trying to minimize their history in those areas. They're trying to understand it. That's our job as archeologists, to understand the human past, except in the, in the Americas. So there's been a, a, grew, a very strong opposition from the group, which is growing smaller and smaller, that seek to maintain control of and power over the indigenous past. And, um, and I really believe now that's starting to change. And I see more people publishing and talking about older sites, but it was very dangerous, uh, especially if you were an academic to talk about sites older than Clovis in the Americas. And that was because of racism and embedded colonization within archeology span and their desire to support the nation state story of this was a land of terra nullis. People weren't using the land, therefore it was okay to take the land, it was okay to um, put a head price on, on those people because they weren't really people. So there were uh, head prices on indigenous people, you know, back in the 1800s and 1900s, you could kill them and get $50 to $500 for a scalp. That's very dehumanizing, right? So when archeologists deny indigenous histories and indigenous humanities, they're supporting the nation state in all of that. Okay, I totally agree. So Sandra sort of has something actually related to this. Um, she says, thank you so much for your work. So valuable and important. 
Can you suggest indigenous scholars doing this kind of scholarship in the Andes, in the Amazon, in you know other places in the Western Hemisphere, um, or is no one doing it other than you? Um, as far as I know, I'm the only indigenous person working on the indigenous Pleistocene history of the Americas in the world. And so, like I said, I got an email this week and that person told me that the archeologists in Bogota don't even look at earlier than Holocene sites because of the pressure against earlier than Clovis sites in the United States. So the pressure is not just been in the US and Canada, it's on archeologists all over. And people like Tom Dillahay, he lost his funding when he published his dates and talked about his dates at Monte Verde. You know, Bell lost his job at the Museum of Man in Ottawa for saying the Shenandoah site was older. It was very dangerous. And people in a lot of countries don't have secure employment. The little they have, they don't wanna lose. So they don't rock that boat. Um, I would love to meet other indigenous archaeologists working on Pleistocene sites of the Northern Hemisphere, but I think that's something I'm going to have to really reach out, and I know that in a lot of areas they're not comfortable doing that. So we're just at a beginning place of opening up these discussions and making this area of archaeology a safer space for everybody to work in. Yeah. Um, a few uh, last questions. One is from Michael. He says, hello, Dr. Steves. This is Michael Kicking Bear from the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation located in Connecticut. As you know, our tribes here in the Northeast region, renamed as New England, are dealing with increased activity in the outer continental shelf for wind energy development. The federal government agencies state to us that all their decisions making is informed science and evidence yet they ignore your work. How can tribes fight the assertions that development will not affect our submerged cultural sites in the Atlantic? Thank you. You have to deny them permission and call me anytime if you wanna arrange a meeting with them, if you want to arrange uh, a, something public that might be covered by the news, have them call me. I mean, we have all the data, all the evidence to show that was an entirely cultural area and by law, they shouldn't be disturbing that area with proper considerations that they might impact cultural resources. So I think if they're, you know, after my report and all the work we did, if they're still ignoring that, you're gonna just have to have blockades and all kinds of protests and make it public and let people know that this is what they're doing. Thank you. Um, we'll do one last question from Aaron. Are you seeing additional evidence coming to light in Russia or Northern North America as the permafrost melts and megafauna fossils turn up or other archeological sites turn up? Yeah, we were, and also advanced technology. So um, a scientist from the Northeast, I've lost his name. He's an amazing scientist. He does all this amazing earth science, but they looked at soil and found signs of humans um, I forget what the signs were, but they found chemical signs of humans in that soil dating back over 30,000 years. So I'm just beginning to work on putting together uh, research to look at all these sciences and technologies and to ask the question, you know, of what to show, was it possible at 2.1 million years when people were in Northern China, you know, was it possible environmentally and in any other way, was it impossible for people to have migrated to North America? And I'm pretty sure that's gonna show it was never impossible. So what are the technologies we can use? We know there's a number of archeological sites that date earlier, mm -hmm. but finding signs of humans in the soil using DNA and using proteins is really amazing, important work that's gonna move this field forward. So it's not that there aren't archeological sites here that are that old, it's that they've been denied and people have been afraid to do that work. So I see a really bright future in this area for a lot of people using all these technologies and having the field opened up with my work and my book that it, you know, gonna become safer to work in this area. Yeah, so I actually am gonna add one more question because it just came in from our past president of the MAS, uh, Dr. Swana Crowley. Uh, 
just so you know, her nickname is Dr. Dirt. She is a geoarchaeologist. So sort of going along your lines of soil and everything, um, she writes, just curious if you have explored the contributions of geoarchaeology in this early time period and these sites, something that combines the geosciences and a landscape perspective, but adds data that does not require artifacts or other cultural materials to contribute to the analysis. Yeah, I'm proposing that in a new grant that I'm just working on now. And I have an indigenous and a Western um, geographer working with me. And I wanna reach out to some geologists because I think that's really important. I, like I said, we need to look at all the pieces of the evidence. And when we do that, it's, it's un, un, amazing what you're gonna find, yeah. right? Yeah, no, whenever I talk to Suwana, it's, it's just amazing what dirt can tell you, right? So, yeah. um, okay, so uh, those are the questions we had for right now. Sorry to everyone who we did not get to your question. Um, so thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which is in two weeks on Wednesday, October 6th, when we are joined by Jack Gary, who will be speaking about the oldest black uh, Baptist church in Williamsburg, Virginia. And again, we rely on the supporters of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So again, thank you, Dr. Steves, for your time and your expertise. Um, everyone, this will be on, um, on our YouTube page. So, you know, look out for that. And we have a ton of thank yous coming in and everything. So, um, so yeah. So, have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you.